Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. We're an independent podcast with over 125 free episodes. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murder20.com. Thank you for helping us keep our creative minds writing into the wee hours of the night. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. A short 10 miles north of Los Angeles in California is the city of Burbank. Its population grew steadily and by the mid-1990s was 100,000. The city is home to Walt Disney and Warner Brothers Studios, where popular TV shows were filmed, such as ER and Friends. Next to the studio was Warner Brothers Records, and that's where Dixie Hollyer worked for 13 years as a manager of international special projects. The Warner Brothers label has been home to many artists, including Cher, Alice Cooper, Van Halen, Fleetwood Mac, Madonna, and Green Day. Dixie grew up in a big family in the 60s, a flower child who walked to her own drumbeat. She was intelligent, articulate, and great at her job. Rather than dressing the corporate part, she was more comfortable working in jeans with a dark blonde hair hanging down long and straight. By 1995, Dixie and her husband Tom Bray had divorced. And Dixie was now a single mom, looking after two teenage girls and a young son. Devoted to her children, they lived in a modest duplex covered in beige stucco. Located on a short block of West Oak Street, it was just around the corner from busy West Olive Avenue, filled with local shops and a few minutes drive from the record studio. Although Dixie worked hard, she was not rich, and having medical issues, she wanted to ensure she could care for her three children, so she took out an insurance policy with just over $300,000, enough to support them until they became adults and see them through college. 17-year-old Amber was bright, with a vivacious smile, and long blonde hair past her shoulders. She was a cheerleader, attended a church youth group, and was on the honor roll in high school. But then, things changed, and she began skipping school. She and her mother, Dixie, were constantly arguing, and on weekends, the neighbors could hear the shouting matches. Amber's grades began to drop. Deadly Women's episode described Dixie getting a call from Amber's school, that she had skipped class, and that led to more arguments. Amber's teenage resentment of her mother evolved into pure, outright hatred. She began fantasizing about what life would be like without her mother. Due to her poor attendance, Amber transferred to another high school, one where she became more of a loner. Then, in the fall, mutual friends introduced Amber to 21-year-old Jeffrey Ayers. Looking older than his years, his sturdy frame was large, but not muscular. His dark hair cut short. He wore oversized dark-framed glasses that gave off a nerdy vibe. He spent hours playing Dungeons & Dragons, a fantasy role game in which his character was called G. O.D. The Los Angeles Times reported that Jeffrey had dreamt of joining the Marines or the National Guard, but a shoulder injury prevented him. 
His grandmother had recently passed and left him a small inheritance. He lived rent-free with his mother in her apartment and spent his time hanging out at local arcades and coffee shops. He was known to be generous, and when his friends were low on cash, he'd buy them a meal or groceries. After dropping out of high school, he drifted from job to job while trying to make money with the latest get-rich-quick scheme. Jeffrey had never really shown much interest in girls, but Amber was different. Much to the surprise of Jeffrey's friends, he fell hard for her. And within a couple of months, they were making plans to get married as soon as she turned 18. Dreaming about their wedding plans and what it would be like to walk down the aisle, Amber drew up a guest list. The majority of the 100 guests were made up of her friends and family, with only a few spots reserved for Jeffrey's side. And intentionally missing from the list were her mother and sister Amy. Amber methodically began confiding in Jeffrey about just how terrible her mother was and accused her of abusing her. It wasn't true, but Jeffrey didn't know that as he listened with a compassionate ear. Amber ratcheted up her plan telling Jeffrey she was considering suicide to get away from her mother. He couldn't let that happen. He was too in love with her. So he assured her he would do something. Amber had created the perfect storm. She convinced Jeffrey that in order for their new life to begin together, her old life had to disappear. And the way to make that happen was to get rid of not only her mother, but her 15-year-old sister, Amy. Her five-year-old brother would be spared. For months, the starstruck lovers sent notes and letters back and forth. Putting pen to paper, they planned and imagined what married life would be like. Somehow, Amber found out about her mother's life insurance policy And in one of her letters to Jeffrey, she laid out how they would use the money to buy a house an hour away in Riverside and furnish it, buy a flashy little sports car, and still have enough left over for a savings account. He would go to college and study psychology, and she would become a model. Perhaps that's why Amber planned to eliminate Amy so that she didn't have to share the inheritance. We don't really know what was going through Amber's mind, but we do know that in one of those letters, she asked Jeffrey, and I quote, What do you think of this? Someone breaks into the house and kills Amy and Mom. I come home to discover them. Call police. Neighbors hear nothing, and it goes on record as an unsolved homicide. I like it. In another letter, she asks, Have I snapped? Before saying, Plotting murder and stuff? After years of abuse, I've had it. In a letter back to Amber, Jeffrey reassured her, I meant what I said on the phone. Your mother and your sister will trouble you no more. Christmas came and went, and 1996 slid into view. Dixie and Amber still weren't getting along. But Dixie assumed it was just usual teenage stuff. On January 6th, it was Amber's 18th birthday, and Jeffrey took her out to dinner to celebrate. A week later, Jeremy purchased a steel blue revolver capable of five shots. That night, knowing what was next, it's likely he didn't sleep a wink. It was Tuesday, January 15th. Amber left the front door unlocked, and at 5 a.m., Jeffrey let himself in to the duplex on West Oak Street. Amber led him to her mother's purse and reached in and handed him an ATM card and cash 
in an attempt to stage a robbery. He stuffed them into his pocket and carried on. Amy and her younger brother were sound asleep. In the darkness, he crept slowly down the hallway to Dixie's bedroom. Amber was right on his heels. Reaching Dixie's door, he entered and slinked his way to her bed. He raised the gun barrel. His hand shaking slightly, he steadied himself and pulled the trigger. The bullet exploded into Dixie's skull. Her eyes flashed open. It wasn't like the movies or a video game. His opponent did not die from a single shot. Rather, Dixie rolled out of bed and began crawling towards the doorway. Jeffrey followed. Dixie kept crawling towards the front door. He panicked and grabbed three large knives from the kitchen. He fired a second shot, then beat her with the gun. She was down, but not out. He picked up one of the knives and began stabbing her. He slit her throat and severed her windpipe. Amy heard noises and woke up to sheer terror and chaos. She raced to the kitchen and towards a phone on the wall. Jeffrey continued to stab Dixie. <laughs> Amy lifted the receiver and dialed 911. Amber ran for the cord and pulled it out of the wall. Amy fought to push the cord back in. But Amber knew she couldn't let her make that call. Her mother needed to die. She gripped the phone tightly and ripped it out of the wall. Meanwhile, a neighbor had woken up by the gunshots and heard a woman screaming and called police. They arrived within minutes. Walking through the door, they saw Jeffrey crouch down, straddling Dixie. With a bloody knife raised, he had stabbed her 24 times and was about to strike again. Officers yelled out for him to drop the knife. He glanced up to see uniforms and badges. He dropped the knife, threw his hands up in the air, and declared, Okay, you got me. Dixie died at 42. Dixie fought hard to save her life, and in doing so, bought precious minutes that in turn saved Amy. Burbank police told the media, We didn't get there soon enough to save Mrs. Hollier, but we did get there in time to save Amy. Police began questioning Amber, Amy, and their younger brother. Amber and Jeffrey were both arrested on suspicion of murder. Investigators combed the crime scene room by room and discovered Jeffrey's letters to Amber. Then at his mother's apartment, they found Amber's letters to him. A day later, Amber and Jeffrey were charged with one count of capital murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Although there was no doubt Jeffrey had been the one to kill Dixie, the couple's letters pointed to Amber, who orchestrated her mother's murder. Amber's friends and family did not believe she could be involved. They declared publicly that authorities had made a mistake, and they were in the courtroom to support her. As her family wept, Amber entered wearing her blonde hair tied back and a baggy black hoodie with lettering across the front. Then Jeffrey was brought into the courtroom wearing jailhouse blues. He was led to the jury box and sat down a few seats from Amber. 
but neither stole a glance at the other. Amber's family were still in denial and wanted her to attend her mother's funeral. A Superior Court judge ruled that she could attend the funeral, but not the burial. There was a concern of security for transporting her between the two venues and the risk that she may try to escape. But just hours before her mother's funeral at a Catholic church in Burbank, a judge rescinded the order. Apparently, a relative had complained, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office had also objected, citing security concerns and the number of officers that would be required to protect Amber. Family and friends of Dixie's arrived at the church to the solemn words of Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven and the melody of Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. Dixie's pale pink casket stood at the altar, covered in white and pink roses. Her ex-husband Tom picked up his trumpet and began with a melancholy, amazing grace. Then in a nod to Dixie's free spirit, he transitioned into When the Saints Go Marching In. The casket was loaded into the hearse. Dixie was laid to rest at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in the Hollywood Hills. Two weeks after the murder, Amber and Jeffrey were back in court. They sat in the jury box, separated by three seats. Neither one glanced at the other as they entered their pleas of not guilty. A family friend had prepared signs with red hearts, stating Amber Bray is innocent. Two years later, Amber and Jeffrey went on trial. Each would have their own jury. They sat side by side, but not touching. As a deputy district attorney read their letters to each other out loud, they closed their eyes, dropped their heads, and hid their faces with their hands. Amber's lawyer tried to rebuff them by saying the letters proved they were planning for the future, not murder. Both were found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As of this writing, both are still incarcerated. Amber is 45 years old. Her profile on the Writer Prisoner website says that she is looking to correspond with people and hopefully make some friends. She states that she is intelligent, loyal, and honest, and that she values those qualities in others. And she goes on to say, If you share any of my interests and would like to make a friend, you should take a chance on me. You won't regret it. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of serial killer Randall Woodfield. Being drafted into the NFL is every minor league football player's dream, and Randy was no exception. But his inability to control his anger and deviant behavior landed him in prison. After his release, bodies began piling up. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Vaseline Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. If you'd like to support our creative, independent true crime podcast, we'd be internally grateful. 
rifle through the couch cushions, and donate your spare change by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or Murder20.com. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.